Adam Smith, an incredible speaker, uh, an incredible uh, human being. Thank you. And uh, she currently serves as the executive director of the West Boulevard Neighborhood Coalition. Jordan uh, and I actually met for the first time today, although uh, I've introduced her at, at another meeting and we've had many, many conversations about what the West Boulevard Neighborhood Coalition is doing. And I tell you, it, it is just such an important community group. It is a great honor for me to, uh, to introduce her and to let her talk to you about what they do. I am also particularly happy because we are going to be partnering with the West Boulevard Neighborhood Coalition for our district grant project this year. Uh, most of you don't know that, but that was something that was um, approved by our grants committee and, and submitted to the district by, um, by our club. So we are looking forward to partnering with their community garden. garden. And we're also looking at partnering, looking forward to partnering with them on the mentoring aspect of this, because that's what this whole project is about. It's about providing them, helping them to provide them with uh, equipment for their community garden, which helps to feed people in what is a, a very significantly large food desert uh, in that, that West Boulevard corridor. But also you're gonna hear about what that community garden does and how they're putting kids to work and how they're literally changing lives. I love what, what uh, when we wrote, when we submitted this project, we had this description on what Seeds for Change, which is their community garden does. And um, their, their, your board president described it as much more than a community garden more of a youth leadership program, a youth education program, and youth participation in a plan for sustainable community development. So folks, we're gonna be hitting on a number of our focus areas, including maternal and child health, financial literacy and education, and, and youth development. So without any further ado, it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce Jordan Brooks Adams. Jordan. <laughs> and I will get your presentation started. Wow, you are doing it, Kelly. Hello, everybody. It is so nice to meet you all to join you today for lunch and for this Rotary uh, meeting. This is actually my first time ever being in a Rotary setting. So this is a new experience for me as well, but I am honored to be here with you all and I'm really excited to share with you about the West Boulevard Neighborhood Coalition and the work that we do along the West Boulevard area. I'm going to look here. Okay, great. So, um, and thank you so much, Kevin, for the introduction. As he mentioned, I am the executive director of the West Boulevard Neighborhood Coalition, which is a nonprofit organization um, that actually was formally incorporated in 2007, but our roots reach back for generations even before that. So um, we can trace our roots into, into the community organizing work of the 1960s and 70s along the West Boulevard area. And then there's a lot of history that we trace even back to the late 1800s in the slave communities that, are, are, that were in the area that is currently West Charlotte, but at the time that was outside of the city limits. So we can trace a lot of our history and our lineage the community development work for well over a century. So who are we? Who is the West Boulevard Neighborhood Coalition? Um, our mission, and this is a new mission, we recently went through a series of um, board retreats where we redeveloped our mission and our strategic priorities. And so our new mission is to drive community-led strategies promoting economic and community development for residents and businesses along the West Boulevard corridor. And to give you all some context, context about that shift, I actually am a new executive director. I'm the first executive director. And I do like to highlight that because a lot of what we're gonna hear about today and talk about 
was all the work of our volunteer led board up until October 26, 2020 is when I came on board and got hired. Um, and that was my first day. So I have been with the coalition for less than a year at this point. Um, and I love to lift up that everything that we're gonna talk about was volunteer led and the community that carried this up until I came on board as the first full-time person and the first um, executive director as well. So we have three strategic pillars that guide our work. They are community development, economic development, and health equity. And again, these new uh, strategic pillars came out of our reimagining that we did in, in February as um, you know, I took the board through a series of conversations about what is the work, um, what is what is the West Boulevard Neighborhood Coalition doing? What is the work that we're doing? And then how has that continued to evolve? And what do the strategic pillars need to look like in the future? So to really, um, for the sake of time, because I wanna get into like the conversational piece, I don't wanna park too much in like the formalities of what we do. Um, I wanna lift it for you all. One of the first things that, um, and primary things that we love to talk about and that even Kevin mentioned, which is our flagship program, the Seeds for Change Urban Farm. And these are actual photos of the farm and some of the youth who work on the farm. It is a quarter acre urban farm at the, at, uh, the corner of Romare Beard and then West Boulevard, which is right across the street from the Charlotte Mecklenburg West Boulevard Library Branch. And if you know where the Stratford Richardson YMCA is, we're kind of catty corner to them. That's like Clinton and West Boulevard, Donald Ross, and then we're, you know, the next block over diagonally. And so we actually have a large parcel of land that we have a long-term ground lease within Libyan um, in order to have not only the farm, but then an additional project that I'm going to talk to you about in a moment. But the Seeds for Change urban farm came out of a vision for the West Boulevard area um, to provide fresh, healthy produce to the neighbors and residents along the area because we are in a food desert. So a food desert um, is typically defined as, and, and federally <laughs> defined as an area where 30%, um, at, at least 30% of the residents in the area have to travel a mile or more to get to the nearest grocery store. So along the West Boulevard area, we are one of the 25 food deserts uh, identified in Me Mecklenburg County. And um, along our area, you will find a number of dollar stores, convenience stores, but the folks in our community don't have access to a big box grocer. You know, whatever brand name is your preference, that access is very limited. Um, and so that has been a systemic issue the neighbors and the community members have advocated and talked to city council and tried to get to city folks and met county folks for decades. We're looking at 40, almost 50 years worth of advocacy saying, hey, we need a grocery store. We don't have access to food. And after so many years of trying to get a grocery store in the area, for whatever reason, it hasn't worked out from a real retail perspective or what have you. Um, the folks themselves, the community members themselves decided, you know what, if we cannot have access from some retail, we're gonna provide our own grocery options, our own produce options. And so that's what we do at the Seeds for Change Urban Farm. So we grow North Carolina appropriate agriculture and it ranges from anything from corn, okra, collards, cabbage, watermelon, yes, grapes, yes. <laughs> all of it, tomatoes, peppers, the, you name it, we grow it. We have um, two different growing <coughs> seasons typically. We'll have our spring season, our fall season. Um, it is typically in operation from March until November. And this is our 12th growing season. So we've now been at this for about six years. And um, we accept not only you know cash and debit credit, but we also accept um, EBT and SNAP to make you know the produce ex as accessible as possible. And then when we do sell it, we sell it at well below market rate. So I'm talking about getting bushels of collard greens for like a dollar and a dollar fifty. You know, like so it's very accessible and it's very affordable for our community members because we want them to have access to fresh produce 
because the convenience stores along the areas typically have these unhealthy options. They're super high in sodium, canned goods, processed foods. So that's why we really lean into, you know, the fresh produce options. But in addition to like the agriculture itself, in addition to the agriculture itself, we also have a youth um, program that is attached to it, which Kevin did mention um, that quote from our board chair, Ricky Hall, who also, um, who was one of the founding members of the, the coalition in 2007 when we were formally incorporated. But then he also is our volunteer farm manager. So he is out there every day in this hot North Carolina sun. <laughs> working on the farm with our with our kids and um he loves the work he's been doing this for years and i can't appreciate ricky enough for his heart to to be a farm manager um but with our youth we actually employ youth that live in the west boulevard area so you're looking at zip codes 28208 28217 28216 typically um and we typically have anywhere from 15 to 20 at any given time throughout the year who will stay with us throughout the whole year. A lot of them repeat. So they have now been in this program with us for, I think this is year number three that they've been with us. And so the youth on the farm have the opportunity to um, make an above minimum wage. So they make $10 an hour. They work during the school year in the afternoon hours from three to six. And then during the summer, because it's so hot, we shift to morning hours like a nine to 12. And so we have youth on the farm who work 15 hours a week, making $10 an hour, um, which is uh, typically ages 14 to 19. So, you know, it's a special kind of contracted youth employment program. Um, and we give them the opportunity to not just learn agricultural skills. So they're not just learning the art of farming and that very um, intrinsic hands in the ground connected to your community in a very like, you know, hands to dirt way, which we want them to be invested in the community itself, feel that physically through the dirt. And then they're learning agricultural skills, but then they're also engaged in a fairly rigorous um, program that does youth development, leadership development. We've done small business training. We walk them through how to develop business plans. And so we partner with other organizations such as the Rotary Club and other folks who will mentor them and give them access to great resources. So they're earning an income, they're engaged in their community, they're you know doing something productive with their time in the afternoons and then in the summer. And then they're learning great life skills at the same time. So this is um, a fairly involved program. We have continued to grow and evolve over the last few years. Um, we're looking to continue to grow as always and even partner with some of the local schools in the area. For example, you have the, it's now Charles Parker Academy. It was formerly Barringer Academy that was just went through a renaming um, as well as even Niner School. So we have some opportunities to partner with local school systems because our vision is to even create an alternative to in-school suspension and out-of-school suspension. Let's say they can do some, some time and learn some skills on the farm instead of you know, being kicked out of the school and doing nothing with their time. And you know, so, so to do something that is more productive in partnership with the school systems as well in the area. So that is our flagship program, Caesar Change Farm. Uh, it is wonderful. The kids are great. Um, it's so much energy, but they are engaged um, throughout the day when we have the, the time and so, or, you know, when they're on the farm. And in addition to, you know, these literacy programs, we have helped them start bank accounts so that when they get paid from the farm, it goes direct deposit into a new bank account and you're learning banking skills. We have walked them through budgeting and finance. We have walked them through, you know, some of these basic skills that you just normally don't learn in a classroom, but you need in order to be an adult. And for some reason, we never teach it in school. Those are the skills that we like to focus on with them, as well as partner them with a therapist so that, you know, they can get some great coping skills to deal with the stress of life because life has been stressful. And it's, you know, it's great to learn those skills in your youth so that you can better deal in, in your adulthood. One thing that I can say before we shift to the flagship project related to Seeds for Change Farm is that 
throughout COVID and this pandemic, our youth really became essential workers. So they became like not just kids who weren't in school during the pandemic, but they were on the farm every day. We had to ramp up our hours because so many more people than our usual were coming to the farm to get produce at a, at a more affordable rate because of the food security challenges that a lot of households faced throughout the pandemic. I mean, we saw this influx and increase in our food pantries around the, the country, really, as more people were out of work and, and needed access to just pantry staples. Well, we did a lot of donations from the farm during the pandemic. So we gave away a lot of food when we did our COVID relief events and utility pay events. And then our youth themselves were more engaged on the farm. But we had quite a few of them come back and tell us stories about how the groceries, you know, the produce that they would get as a donation as well, they would help with their households. And even how the income that they made on the farm helped to make a difference when mom or dad lost a job during the pandemic and they were able to pour back in and help their household. So the responsibility that they were learning and gaining through um, our program is just phenomenal. And it, it makes you cry because they were so young but and having that responsibility, but at the same time, you know, to know that they gain so much from being engaged with us has been awesome. So coming out of the Seeds for Change Farm, you know, this was our six, this is our sixth year, 12th growing season. And this was one portion of our addressing food security. The other um, part of it is this vision that we had for a food cooperative. With it along the lines again, that if they being institutions, being structures, those folks in decision-making power, even retailers would not build a grocery store in the area, then we would build our own. And so that is the vision for the Three Sisters Market. Um, Three Sisters itself is an homage to the multiple generations and iterations of three black women who have led the community going back into the 60s. We've had like these three women generally who have led the charge. And so um, I wish I, our board chair, Ricky Hall, could make it because he can give you their names and talk about the stories. He was born and raised in West, in West Boulevard. Um, unfortunately, I do not know the names off the top of my head. It's still fairly new and still fairly absorbing all of the history. But Three Sisters is an homage to the powerful women in the community who have led our area. And so that is why we call the Three Sisters Market. There are three trees on the site of the market. It's, so those are our three sisters on site. Um, but this is a, food, a cooperative food market that will serve not just the West Boulevard residents, but anybody who wants to come and shop there. And the idea is for it to be community owned and community led. So what does it look like for food to be sovereign, right? It's not just about access to food, but it's about ownership of the resources so that you're not beholden to someone else to have to give to you, but you have ownership of resources. That is a wealth building idea. It helps to empower the community. It elevates the community. And that's why we're looking to build a Three Sisters Market. So I met Kevin because um, we did a presentation to the Met County Board of County Commissioners um, where we presented this project to them. And we are really grateful to have their funding for a year one pilot program. It will be a essentially storage container, like modular unit upfit, a small scale that as we are building out this market model, this pilot model, we're able to build our supply chain and kind of put all the pieces in place for phase one as we're building out this model to then scale up to a full scale grocery store at some point. Um, in the very near future. So that is our flagship project. Those are our two main things that we do right now. We have the Seas for Change Farm, the flagship program, and then Three Sisters Market is our flagship project. But in addition to that, we do a lot of other things that I'm not gonna bore you with the minutia of all of it. But just to give you some bullet points, we have a pilot community health worker um, initiative that we are working in partnership with Atrium Health for a grant funded community based community health worker so someone from the neighborhood who can connect the neighborhood with the right resources within the healthcare system, so that folks can get access to what they need within healthcare system It can be a little confusing and a little, you know, overwhelming if you're not familiar with who to talk to and how to get there so this is our pilot project with Atrium, we also support a number. Um, 
the rezoning petition. So when developers are coming into the area, we advocate on behalf of the community and work with them to develop community benefits agreements and how do we get the community to stay attached to these development projects that folks are not getting pushed out and the gentrification isn't happening. In addition, we are uh, the West Boulevard Neighborhood Coalition is a founding member of the Charlotte Community Benefits Coalition, uh, which has been a part of a lot of the conversations surrounding this 2040 process. We are also engaged in the Charlotte Regional Transit Coalition, and we worked with the city of Charlotte through 2018 and 19 on the implementation of the West Boulevard Playbook, which is a playbook, essentially a 170 page document that works through some market studies, it works through some vision planning for what we would like to see as a community along the corridor. And this was the first time that the city did it in partnership with a community organization, which was the West Boulevard Neighborhood Coalition. And now they've taken the model that they built with us and the city is now doing that in other parts of Charlotte, which you may have heard about other playbook initiatives around the area, uh, around the city. Well, ours was the first one that they did in the community um, in partnership with the Economic Development Department. So that is, you know, us in a nutshell, a very tight nutshell. There's a lot more kind of within what we do and how we do it, it becomes very complex. Um, I am very grateful for our board, who five out of six of them are lifelong residents of the West Boulevard area. So our board is comprised of folks who have lived expertise. So it's not just book knowledge, but they know the needs of the community because they are the community and they have roots in the community. And they also can partner that with their professional experience as well. So we have our board chair, Ricky Hall, our vice chair is Brenda Campbell, and then a few other members, Guy Cousins, um, Esquire, Shaniqua Thomas, uh, Beverly Clark, and Dr. Korsha Coleman. And I am, again, the ED. I am actually the only full-time employee. I am a party of one doing the job of about 10, but I love it. It's still, it's great. It is awesome work. Um, and so I'm really excited to have shared with you a snapshot of who we are and what we do. Um, I would also invite all of you to follow us on Facebook, on Instagram. You know, if you want to be connected to our newsletter, send an email to info at westblbdnc.org. We would love to, share, to, to send you and to keep you in the loop with our newsletter um, so that you can stay connected to what we're doing and some of the events and things that happen along the corridor. As well, we are a part of National Night Out. So on August 3rd, we'll be at the Clanton Park Outreach Center um, or Arbor Glen Outreach Center, which is on Clanton Road, excuse me, um, West Boulevard and Clanton. And we'll be out there from six to eight, as well as other pockets of communities will be a national night out. So if you want to stop by ours, feel free to stop by our national night out at Arbor Glen Rec Center. Um, and that is us in a nutshell. I would welcome any questions that you all have. Absolutely. Can you repeat this? <clears throat> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what the business case is for our involvement in it, first of all. Uh, this is at the West Boulevard Neighborhood Coalition serves a community of about 19,000 people. Yes. So um, the West Boulevard area, and forgive me for not giving more details about that. So West Boulevard corridor itself goes from 77 up to Billy Graham. And then we're bounded between those two highways and then down to about Tyvola up to Wilkinson. So that entire strip of West Boulevard is what we endeavor to serve. There are 19 communities along that area, which equal about 19,000 residents. Of course, we're not going to touch every single person that's astronomical for a, a, you know, a grassroots organization. However, we do connect with like the neighborhood associations and stay connected to the communities and serve the community, which... You know, I want to emphasize that the West Boulevard area is not just a food desert, it's a healthcare desert, it's a resource resource desert. It's a desert. It is. It's just it's it's it's, it's a book desert. desert. It is. Um and and not because of the community itself, but just the way that the city has grown around it. And of course, you know, there's just a number of systemic and and institutional, you know, barriers to growth in the area. It is predominantly lower income, predominantly African-American. 
lower health uh, attainments and folks actually have a lower life expectancy as compared to Mecklenburg County of about four years. So you're looking at Met County, the average life expectancy, expectancy is 71. In the West Boulevard area, it's only 67. So, you know, ha about half of the area median income as compared to the Met County overall. So with that, the, the grassroots organizing is so important because we believe in community-led solutions and not just dropping band-aids on, you know, challenges, but actually doing the footwork to create a long-term solution and not just any solution, but something that's sustainable, that it can be maintained by the community. So our ask of you all is going to be, <coughs> we're gonna support them with that, obviously, you're a project and five, uh, we'll speak a little bit about that from a foundation perspective. Three years ago, we, we gave money to Rotary International, has come back to us this year to be able to support us uh, in the form of a district grant, which we'll hopefully get mm -hmm. once the finance committee meets. But beyond that, you're going to need people to actually work with these young people. That we put 15 to 20 young people who are trying to change their the trajectory of their lives and to change the trajectory of that community. So we're going to be tapping into you, your expertise in, in life, in your uh, past professions, to reach out and actually help these kids succeed. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Do they teach any of these kind of uh, um, some perhaps. Uh, so, oh, here's another disclaimer. I'm new to Charlotte as well. So I moved to Charlotte in the beginning of October and started the job at the end of October. So my context for the school systems is limited as well as Zoom and the pandemic. So I don't want to say no. I'm not exactly sure how much. <clears throat> yes, yeah. I think West, uh, and I always get them confused, West Charlotte or um, Eric, what's the other West, West High School? What's that? West, West Met. Yeah. So one of the two also has a community garden on the school property, and we have a new partner for Feed the Body, Feed the Mind called The Bulb. We just talked oh, to them, yeah. um, and they actually are now housed in the school, and um, as soon as uh, the, the students come back, they're also going to try and help engage those students in growing um, for The Bulb as well. But The Bulb, instead of staying in, um, you know, that community, they actually go out and distribute in farmers markets and things like that. So um, there's uh, there they, there are these skills being taught. Um, it's just not as widespread. You know, it's like the trade market, right? Trades are not being taught anymore in schools. Like who goes to shop? I mean, there's a couple of places that do shop class, but it's just not a standard thing anymore. Like yeah. I learned how to sew in high school. Which is just serious. Is, is the farm big enough? Who owns that land? So right now the farm is a quarter of an acre um, and we actually have a long-term lease within living for the entirety of the parcel. So we have, we're working on, right now we have a 10-year lease. We're working on a 99-year and just having those conversations with HUD to have a 99-year lease within living so that, that that property stays within the community you know, for another hundred years. And living in is the, the formerly known as the Charlotte Housing Authority. Yes. They, got they did change yeah. their name recently. Yes. They own the land and we have a ground lease with them. So we have access to it and we can build on the land as well. You may want to consider new power. Anywhere you see those big power towers. Yes. Usually it's 100 feet on the inside. Nothing can be built on. Yeah. And so that land just sits there. That is true. An enormous amount of, well, that's the man the right of way. Yeah. You can mind the folks that there's a lot of land sitting on the road. Big power lines are way up there. That's going to be for us. Absolutely. I, yeah, I will look into that. I haven't taken that into consideration, but thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. I think that'd be perfect. Thank you. Um, I actually have some, two questions. Um, one, are you, are you, is your produce um, organic or are you guys actually using, um, you know, standardized pesticides or? 
Um, no, I believe everything is organic. I believe so. Yeah, I, I'm I'm less attached to the day to day of the farm. I'm more of the organizational side, but I, I do believe that everything is organic. Um, and then the other question I had was, um, you know, until the uh, cooperative grocery store gets built, which is freaking fantastic. I, yeah. I'm so impressed to hear that it's already underway. Um, what do you guys do? Do you have excess produce or product? And then what do you do with that? You take it, if you do have excess, do you take it to farmer's markets? Like you take it outside of, of- So right now we sell out of everything we grow. Okay. We actually sell out faster than we can grow it, um, which is so you need awesome. More land, we, we need yeah. more land um, because part, the, the parcel itself is fairly large. We could probably fit, you know, five or six of our existing farm sites on the area. But the reason why we haven't expanded this farm site itself is because we plan to build the food co-op on the land as, as well. So you have this very kind of connective farm to grocer to table connectivity and the farm itself that has been an anchor in the community and has been a familiar place doesn't get knocked down when we go to build the market. Would you, uh, are you guys considering doing like a greenhouse so that you can grow all throughout the year? Yes, so we really wanna lean into a greenhouse. We actually also wanna get into some of like the hydroponics, aquaponics, water growing as well. Um, I will be very frank with you, it's a grassroots organization. So our resources can get very tight um, so we have to maneuver and, and lean into where we can grow, but we absolutely want to do and the hydroponics. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> we do. We have honey. We started honey, um, um, beekeeping last year. We harvested our first honey this year. It tastes so good. It is amazing. And, um, we're actually doing the second part of it. I'd be in. Uh, <laughs> I wish. honey and butter, man. There is nothing better. <laughs> I Except wish. for fried okra. What, what? But we have plenty of, we actually have plenty of okra right now. There's yeah. still so much okra available. So if you all want to come by and buy some okra. There's plenty of okra still at the farm site. Are you guys working with any larger farms in partnership to get their inside support? resources like are you yeah. have those types of relationships so we are in partnership with the carolina farm trust and the black farmers association for the three sisters market because we understand that our quarter acre farm just won't have the supply for the demand of the community so we're going to of course supply off of our farm and then supplement that with the carolina farm trust and black farmers association to have a continued supply for our market so are they working with you guys in terms of education as well so we've had um, a couple of the Met County Master Gardeners come out and do some sessions with the youth as well. So we have that partnership with um, a Master Gardening program in the city, cool. yeah, in the county. She's not here today, but we also have um, a member who is a part of, um, yes, thank you, Bob, who is a part of um, Tree Charlotte. So if okay. you guys need some trees, we can get hooked into that too. So. Oh, that would be great. Um, so. I'd like to transition now. First, let's give her a hand. Yeah. We are very, very excited. I, I, I feel like we're going to get approved for the grant. Oh, no, no. I, no. So. I said it agree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have it in, Jordan. We have it in. Um, and so uh, we're very, very excited uh, to work with you guys on the district grant. Um, our organization, Promising Pages, was um, the district grant for this club last year and um i can't wait to talk to you on behalf of promising pages so yes uh, we'll, i'll be giving you. you i'll be giving you my card <laughs> yeah, um, i have a new program called book seed that is going to fit perfectly uh, okay. with so, <laughs> partnerships yeah we are so um, excited to partner with all kids um so thank you but uh, i'd like bob to come up and uh i would like bob to say a couple of words about the district